Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm an undergraduate fellow at the Center for Ethics, and I'm here today with Professor Joseph Cairns. He's with the Political Science Department at the University of Toronto, having after received his Master's of Philosophy and his PhD from Yale University. And he's here today with us to talk about his book, The Ethics of Immigration. So thank you, Professor Cairns, for coming to the Center for Ethics today. Thanks. Great to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So I was hoping we could start um, this sort of questionnaire with just you explaining kind of your basic research interest area um, and what you're working on right now. And yeah. Sure. So, so um, I've just finished a book on the ethics of immigration, and that's what I worked on for the past 25 or maybe even 35 years. So, and there I was, uh, I, I became interested in that uh, book in uh, what was called the first Haitian refugee crisis in the United States, where people were moving from Haiti. It was a dictatorship. It was extremely poor, but there was also brutal political repression, and people were moving from Haiti to Florida and then being uh, intercepted by the U.S. and put it, that was the first use of Guantanamo. They put the Haitian refugees in Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so this was all in the news and I was troubled by that and trying to think about, well, what, what should be done? And so I, I had to write a paper for a seminar and I thought I'd write about this topic. And, and uh, when I did, I did what students always do when you're uh, writing a paper. You go to look for the literature and I discovered there wasn't any. Mm -hmm. So I took a bunch of the existing political theories at the time and tried to see what they would imply, liberal political theories for this issue. And Such as John Rawls? John Rawls was the most prominent, and then Robert Nozick, who's a libertarian, and utilitarians who are uh, still, in, still another perspective. And I, and I concluded that all, all of these different strands of liberal thought should be for open borders, which, which sort of surprised me, actually. I hadn't anticipated mm -hmm. that. Uh, and so that's what I, how I became interested in that topic. And that was the first piece that I wrote, and it's still probably the line of argument that I'm best known for. But after that, I got invited to a, a conference by the German Marshall Fund, in which the, the, uh, a lot of German scholars and, and uh, politicians were trying to figure out what to do about German citizenship, because they had had people moving in from Turkey and elsewhere as guest workers, and had been there for by this point, uh, 40, 50 years, and their kids had grown up there, and sometimes they had grandkids, and they still weren't citizens because mm -hmm. the Germans had this more ethnic conception of citizenship. So this was a, uh, a meeting on citizenship, and uh, so I was asked to present a paper on that, and, and, and I made an argument about why, why these people should have access to citizenship, but what struck me about that argument is that it had nothing to do with the open borders question. So, so this was an entirely separate kind of normative issue that even if you assume that the Germans got to decide, they had invited these people in, so there was still a question about, that there were other normative questions. And so that set me off on another track around immigration, which is how to treat people who have already arrived and... and, uh, and They've there for 30 years, yeah. have grandchildren. Right, right. So, so that's uh, basically the attempt of the book, is to identify what are the ethical issues that are raised by immigration at all levels, and how should we answer them. Yeah, no, and uh, you push that argument very clearly and strongly. It's a very powerful argument in the ethics of immigration. And it's fascinating because you can live in a country like Germany for years and years. And, you know, you can have your whole family live there. Uh, you have an identity in that country. But if you weren't born there, if you weren't born in that country, then you make the argument that being born in those rich, liberal, democratic societies is like feudal class privilege. And that creates an unjust world. So how does that idea of an unjust world create the foundation for your argument for open borders? Right. So, so uh, in the open borders argument, one of the images I tried to use to communicate why I thought there's something fundamentally unjust about the current arrangements that let states decide who gets in and who doesn't get in. Uh, what I said is, uh, think about feudalism. So uh, today, my assumption is nobody wants to defend feudalism today. There's nobody who says, let's go back to feudalism, right? Everybody agrees that you can't divide the world into the nobles and the peasants and have one rule for the nobles and another rule for the peasants. So everybody accepts that. So I say, well, how is that different from the way we've organized the world as a whole today? Mm -hmm. where people born into rich countries like Canada, the United States, or countries in Europe, 
they're kind of like the nobility. They have all these life advantages that come simply from where they are born, the circumstances into which they're born. And people in the rest of the world uh, are, for the most part, there are a few exceptions, there are kind of few rich peasants, if you will, they're like the peasants of the, of the Middle Ages, in which their life chances, life prospects, the life, health, education, education, uh, you know, whatever is important in, in human life is greatly reduced compared with those born in the rich societies. And that's not a natural thing. We've organized the world that we collectively as human beings have organized the world that way. So I say, well, why is that just? If we think feudalism is wrong, and that seems self-evidently bad, why is this okay? And your solution to that is sort of freedom of movement, because right... Well, you know, yes and no. So one of the points that I try to make is I don't see freedom of movement as a, the cure to global inequality. The problem is really global inequality. And so you need two things in combination. You need both much greatly reduced inequality between states and freedom of movement between states. And once you have reduced inequality between states, freedom of movement between states is not a problem. So there's a way in which freedom of movement, first I think it is an important right in itself. People have good reasons to want to move from one place to, to another. But most people don't want to move. They want to live in the country they grew up, where their friends and family are. And it's important that they have an opportunity to live their lives fully and and appropriately it, there, at home, if they want to. So it's this combination, but, but you couldn't maintain the existing global inequality that we have without constraining freedom of movement. It, it, it just okay. wouldn't be possible to maintain the existing unjust system without uh, eliminating these, uh, without, if you eliminated these constraints on movement. So I don't think of open borders as a policy proposal in the sense that I recognize that any politician who said, I'm for open borders, will be out of office the next day. They'll be fired, they'll be <laughs> not elected. That's, that's obvious, right? There'll be no support for that. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't think uh, about what are fundamentally right and wrong the way we live. And most people think, well, the way things are organized is pretty much okay. And what I'm trying to say is, uh, that's what people thought in the days of slavery. That's what the people thought in the days of uh, oppression of women, when that was overt and explicit and, and part of the legal system. You, were you weren't born in Canada. Right. Um, you were born in the United States, I believe. Um, and then you became a permanent resident of Canada. Right. And I'm wondering, um, how did your experience of being a permanent resident either you know, uh, shape your views for open borders and your views of the Canadian system of classes for immigration. One of the things that was so striking to me was that it didn't make much difference, the fact that I wasn't a citizen. So for 10 years I lived here and I had all the rights and, you know, there aren't that many duties, you have to pay your taxes. Uh, so what was different? Well, I didn't serve on juries and I couldn't vote, which was frustrating, but is, you know, just an occasional kind of thing. And if I got convicted of a major crime, I would have been deported. So but basically that was it. Apart from that, my life was the same. So one of the interesting things about that is that when people talk, they always talk about how important citizenship is. And citizenship is what separates people from others. But it isn't really true. And Canada is no different than the United States or European states in this respect. Once you're a permanent resident, you have most of the rights and privileges and duties that citizens have. So it's really where you live that's crucial rather than what your formal legal status is. Now there are some, I, I would argue that some of these differences even should be abolished, it should be even closer, but already it's pretty close. Absolutely. I'd like to um, ask you about a specific province in Canada sure. um, that I think has a really interesting immigration situation, um, Quebec. Um, Quebec Immigration Minister uh, Kathleen Will in a Globe and Mail article uh, said she was ready to initiate a large reform of relations between new immigrants and Quebec society at large by the end of the year, a process that will include the revision of Quebec's immigration law, which she also said was Immigration reforms needs the, needs the full participation of each and every member of Quebec society. So, does this, do you have a view about how other members of society need to contribute to the lives of immigrants? Do you see what I'm getting yeah. at? Yeah, so, so I thought that was a very interesting story and one of the interesting things about it was that I couldn't tell what the political agenda was. So <laughs> when I, uh, because it sounded open-ended, maybe there isn't, a, maybe she really is, uh, has an open-ended agenda and want, wants to know what people think and wants democratic deliberation, that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. 
it's unusual if there's no <laughs> political agenda, but maybe that's right. Uh, so I thought it was a really, so I think it's a, entirely appropriate that a political community, including a province, should think about, well, how, you know, as people come in, how do we want to respond to this? In what ways do we want to ask immigrants to, to include immigrants, to integrate them, to make them part of the community, and what can we expect of them, and what can they expect of us? Mm -hmm. And so I've got a chapter in the book that actually talks about these sorts of things, and, and I think it's, it's a question of a mutual adaptation. Mm -hmm. So in Quebec's case, the, the policy to which she refers was one, again, I wrote about this in this earlier book. Is Quebec uh, Nationalism is Just. Is Quebec Nationalism Just, in which the short version is yes, at least in some forms. Some, of course, there are always forms of nationalism that are unjust, but, but the reason it's just is that because the Quebec nationalism that was part of this official immigration policy that they've had was basically very open. It said, here's what we expect of immigrants. You learn French, you uh, commit yourself to live in a democratic society in which you respect other people. Okay, that's perfectly reasonable. And then you think, well, what about all the other stuff? Well, you can't expect people to become Catholics or to eat poutine or, you know, it's kind of like, uh, and that's, so it's actually, although there's a lot of rhetoric around this, that formal policy is not different from the rest of Canada. Now, of course, a few, you know, a couple of years ago, there was a big uh, hubbub in Quebec about these uh, Quebec Charter values, and it was aimed at Muslims, frankly, it was, uh, and that was requiring much more conformity, but notice that that whole uh, project got defeated politically. So that shows that even though there is a current in Quebec that would want much more, uh, many more constraints on, on immigrants, as there is in the rest of Canada, so you hear references now in the political campaign to old stock Canadians and, and uh, demands for uh, re removing the niqab and citizenship test, which is playing to those same sentiments mm -hmm. of an attempt to define somebody, well, to be a real Canadian, you have to be like us in these various ways. So how does your theoretical case for open borders um, give us insights into how to respond to this theory? Right. Of so actually, in, in the book, and I think this is right, I don't think the question of how we should respond to this refugee crisis depends in any way on whether or not you accept my argument for open borders. So, so let's say you don't, as most people don't. But still, everybody recognizes there's some claim that refugees have to safe haven. So in the book, what I say is, look, okay, let's assume that states have the right to exercise discretionary control over borders. Still, think about the history of World War II. And this was a period in which Canada and the United States and many European states turned away Jewish refugees from the Nazis. And now we think of that as a terrible failure of our country. There are books written about this, and everybody says that was terrible. We, those people, they did the wrong thing. So now the question is, okay, that should be our standard. You shouldn't have a policy that would justify uh, turning away Jews fleeing Nazis. So what are we doing today? And all of the same concerns that you hear, security concerns, economic concerns, they're the same sorts of justifications that were offered for not admitting refugees today. So it seems to me you've got a, a and people cite this, a, a comparable crisis today to what you had in the period leading up to and after World War II. And we recognize that as a terrible moral failure. And now in Canada and the United States, they've both been pathetic in their responses to this. Uh, again, it's political, as it was, of course, in the 30s. That, that It was not popular to admit Jewish refugees. So politicians catered to that. And that's what's going on today, both in Canada and the United States. And so it was... Surprising, the numbers on Germany are actually much higher than, than the figure you gave. That they're expecting hundreds of thousands to resettle hundreds of thousands of refugees in the next few years. Uh, maybe even 500,000 this year and, and hundreds of thousands more over the next years. And uh, uh, the United States and Canada have been, and others, and Britain, have been very, very uh, restrained by comparison. And here's the problem. You recognize these are human beings in desperate need. And, and somebody has to admit them. Now, right now, the vast majority of these people are in refugee camps in Jordan, in Turkey, in Lebanon. Well, why is it the responsibility of Jordan and Turkey and Lebanon to, to provide new lives and new homes and new places for these people to live? They didn't cause the problem. So why do we think it's OK to expect them to do it and we don't have to do our share? These are people who, it's clear they can't go back to Syria in the foreseeable future. It'd be nice if you could imagine they could go, but they can't. 
So it's not reasonable to expect you know, children to grow up in a refugee camp. They need a new home. Where should that home be? Well, the fair thing would be for everybody to open up space and take some people in and figure out a fair share. And some people are trying to do that, but I'm sorry to say that both Canada and the United States and Britain and a number of other countries are resisting this uh, enormously. But it doesn't depend on open borders. It's important to see that you can be for discretionary control over immigration and still think that we've got a deep obligation to admit refugees, and I think that's right. Why should uh, undergraduate students care about uh, immigration policies and uh, your theoretical argument for open borders? I'm sure there are lots of students at the U of T who have relatives who are caught up in these issues, uh, directly or indirectly, and so then there's an immediate contact. They feel that. It, and, and those who don't, they could imagine themselves, they should be able to imagine themselves in the same circumstances. They're, these are human beings. So the question is whether or not you can imagine. So, you know, there's a danger of feeling, well, I'm in Canada, I'm safe, I don't have to worry about these kinds of things, but, but uh, we should feel connected to other human beings. And, and so, if you think about this refugee crisis, uh, as I think you see this outpouring of response, the, the picture of that little boy suddenly just brought home to people that these are just ordinary people in desperate straits, such that people who love their kids are putting their kids at risk in order to find safety for them, and sometimes they fail. Mm -hmm. So it's a terrible tragedy, and if you, you know, how can you look at that and not be moved, and then not try to think about it? But the, the deeper puzzle, I suppose, is, well, what's the point of arguing for open borders or, and trying to talk about open borders when you can never accomplish anything? But, but here I say, look, there have been lots of times in human history when there are deep injustices that are very difficult to change. If you're in the 18th century and you think slavery is wrong, you, it's going to be a big struggle to get rid of slavery. Most people around you don't care. They're not affected by it directly, and so they say, we don't care. And those who do care have interest at stake and they're trying to preserve it. So we look back at those struggles, we admire the people who fought against it, and, and uh, we're critical of those who did nothing about it. So we have to challenge the kind of complacency that we have about, uh, well, we can't do anything about what's wrong in the world. And we have to find ways to struggle against injustice. Mm -hmm. The opportunity to re-examine the things that you take for granted and get a critical perspective on the way things are. Mine is not the only perspective, you should get lots of different perspectives, but, but uh, you should take the opportunity with these four years to try to think about what's going on, what you believe, what really matters in your lives, and then decide how you want to live.